is welcome to the Boone County History and Cultures Meet the Author Program. I'm David Weber. With today, our guest is Steve Weikenstein, He's the author of three novels and a collection of short, short stories um, set in the Ozarks. I'm looking forward uh, to when COVID has moved on and we can meet in person the third Saturday of every month at 10.30 at, uh, at the History Center. Until then, I'll be doing these Zoom in, um, interviews. Um, I, I would like to thank our sponsors, Simmons uh, Bank and the staff of the Boone County History and Cultural Center for making this interview possible. Uh, our goal is to uh, present authors from mid-Missouri and authors who have a lot to say about Missouri. And Steve um, certainly um, meets those two criteria. If you have any uh, suggestions for authors you would like to uh, uh, have interviewed, um, please send them to me at, at my university address or through the uh, Boone County History and Cultural Center. Well, um, hello, Steve. It's nice to visit with you. It's good to see you. Thanks. Well, thank, you. thank you for having me. Um, so uh, I've learned a little about you. I know that you're from the Ozarks and you got a couple of degrees at, at the University of Missouri and that you've done some teaching. So um, why don't you tell us about yourself? Sure. Uh, well, uh, as you said, I I grew up in uh, the Eastern Ozarks. I was uh, born in Ironton and lived in my early years in Fredericktown. And then my folks moved to Reynolds County when I was small. So that's my territory is over there in that uh, kind of Black River, uh, St. Francis River area. And uh, after I finished high school, I came up here to Columbia and um, got my bachelor's in journalism at the journalism school and then went back and worked in newspapers back in my home area. Um, but I've always been interested in, in fiction writing and creative writing in general. So uh, after a few years of that, I came back and got degrees in English, uh, specifically in creative writing and then just a general uh, doctorate in literature. Um, and then I started uh, on the teaching circuit. Um, I've taught it at a number of institutions. Uh, for the longest time I was at Culver Stockton College up in Canton. Um, and then came back here to Columbia to take a job. Uh, so sort of felt like I was coming full circle. Uh, since then I've, I've retired, but all throughout my career, I, I engaged in creative writing. So. Uh, in the, uh, the span of the last decade or so, I've uh, published three novels and a collection of short stories. Yeah. So that's kind of me. So when did you um, publish your first creative work? Well, that... uh, I've been publishing short stories since the, basically since the mid 1980s. And those would tend to be in literary magazines and, and things like that. So. It's been a long sort of process of doing short stories one by one by one. Uh, and they never got collected uh, until just this year. So that was kind of a thrill for me to go back and dig out those old stories, work on them a little bit, make them uh, uh, better in some, in some uh, ways. And, you know, see how, see how they held up over the decades. Yeah. So then, um, I guess your first major work are these, uh, a series of three novels. That's and right. the first one was published right. in 2012, I believe. Right. So um, you must have, uh, when did you get your bachelor's of journalism? What oh, year? Oh, golly. Uh, 1976. 76. Yeah. So uh, I think I got mine in my bachelor's in 73, so I guess uh -huh. I'm three years older than you. So uh -huh. um, how long were you a, a news reporter then? A long time? Oh, just three years. No, oh, oh, that's just, all? Uh, oh. Yeah, I was just down there for three years before I got the itch to 
come back to school and yeah. uh, uh, you know when I was working on a master's degree they gave me some classes to teach and that yeah. was kind of rewarding so it sort of redirected my career into teaching mm -hmm. after after that yeah. so um uh, I taught at West Virginia University for mm -hmm. four years and I have followed Appalachia for a long time, but I've been in Columbia for 30 years and I probably have not thought about the Ozarks um, except for whitewater floating, I guess. Um, yeah. uh, what, what are the Ozarks? I mean, how would you explain to someone the culture or the uh, well, identity of the Ozarks? That's a great question, you know, because um, there's, there's the geographic Ozarks, you know, which is kind of the, the uplift and the mountainous region in Southern Missouri and Northern Arkansas and Northeast Oklahoma. But then sort of overlaid on that is the cultural Ozarks, which roughly cover the same territory, but not quite. And, and I think the cultural Ozarks have an awful lot in common with the the, the Southern Midlands in general and Appalachia, the, you know, Tennessee, Kentucky, those kinds of regions, they, they share a lot of cultural um, characteristics. And so you can sort of see that as, a, as an extension of the Midland South up into, you know, this basically the Southern third of, of the state of Missouri. And they're very, you know, I think, I, I think they're kind of culturally distinct but they do share a lot with just rural life in general. You know, there's a, there's a kind of a common uh, set of uh, characteristics that, that go on in the Ozarks that happen in, in rural areas all over the country, really. Uh, do you think there's a, a, um, more of a sense of community? I mean, the, um, in, in the Appalachia, because of hollows, in uh, mm -hmm. mountain, um, people are often, you know, sort of stuck together because of, of geography and geology. Yeah. It, it, um, yeah. I do. Ozarks like that too. I think they are. Um, maybe not quite as pronounced uh, as in Appalachia, but certainly there is a, a really distinct uh, sense of outsider and insider in a lot of Ozark communities and. Um, you know, there's there's a character in one of my stories who says you're not really from here until you've buried somebody here. You know, and there's uh, that kind of sense of, uh, you know, it, it's it's a hard task to become an insider in a in a small town like that. Yeah. So then uh, these book um, these books, and I noticed that the I guess the umbrella title is mm -hmm. a novel of utopian dreams and the mm -hmm. Civil War. Well, um, how did you uh, how did you come to set this in in the 1950s, 1850s? Excuse me. Sure. Um, well, I'd always been for a long time. I'd been really interested in uh, 19th century utopian communities, of which there are many across across the country. And and you know we think of the famous ones like Brook Farm in Massachusetts and New Harmony, Indiana, Oneida, New York. Um, but there was also, I, I was particularly interested in a group that were called the Icarians, who were French immigrants who came in 1848. And their, their first settlement was in the, uh, the remains of the Nauvoo community up in Illinois. After the Mormons had been forced out of Nauvoo, they sold a good portion of their holdings there to the Icarians. And they were utopian socialists, basically, um, who then split up uh, after a few years. Some of them went to Iowa. Some of them came down to St. Louis. Uh, and I just, you know, they were just a fascinating group to me. And so um, I, I researched them uh, uh, for a long, long time. And the thing about utopians uh, in general, and certainly 19th century utopians, is uh, the immense you know, optimism and the degree of commitment that they display, even if they're, you know, people from the outside thought of them as 
crazy or you know kind of off center um you have to admire their resilience and their their effort um so about the end of uh about 2007 i guess i got the idea to to incorporate a utopian community into a series of novels i of course, I've been writing short stories all this time, but I felt am a little more ambitious and decided to embark on a uh, on a novel. And so the idea of bringing together my kind of scholarly interest in utopian societies with uh, my my personal background as a native of the Ozarks, and you know, relocating it into uh, this that particular historic area. Um, really kind of fit for me. Uh, I chose the 1850s because, of course, it was the years leading right up into the Civil War. And, and I don't think people necessarily appreciate enough what Missouri was like during the Civil War. And, uh, you know, that to me is a real, another, you know, horrifying but fascinating uh, part of history that mm -hmm. uh, de deserves some attention. Mm -hmm. And then when was the... Um... Oh, sort of economic development and the growth of timber and industry and stuff. When was that? That, uh, that the in in a on an industrial scale that started in the late 1880s, uh, continued okay. through the last decade of the 19th century, and then into the first decade of the 20th. So, <clears throat> the great timber boom of the Ozarks was basically about a 15, 17, 20 year period right there in the right around the, the turn of the 20th century. Yeah, because I noticed that you, you captured some of that in your third, third, yeah. third what, do you, uh, what do you call it? Is this historical fiction or novel or how, how do you describe these? Well, yeah, I describe them as, as historical novels. Um, although I, I do have to say that, uh, you know, when people hear the term historical novel, they often think immediately of like, uh, kings and queens <laughs> and, you know, great men, you know, or, or knights fighting with swords and that sort of thing. And that's really not what I'm interested in. I'm much more interested in the struggles of everyday people and, you know, in some ways of how what's happening in history influences the lives of ordinary folks. Uh, like in Slant of Light, you know, the Civil War is begins uh, there but there are really no great battles or anything like that. And of course, that's the way it was in Missouri for the most part. But there's just tremendous amount of, of upheaval and hardship and people having to cope with things that they never imagined that they would ever have to deal with before, you know? And, and so it's historical fiction, but uh, it's not about the lives of the grand, I guess. <laughs> Would you have uh, much occasion to talk about the growth of government, and especially, for example, public education? I guess that, um, in the rest of the country probably started in 1870, mm -hmm. I think right after the Civil War. Was that true of the Ozarks too? Well, it comes along later in the Ozarks. And um, the one that I'm, I'm, I'm working on a fourth book for that series uh, right now, <clears throat> it, which takes place right around 1903, 1904. And that's really when public education just started to get a hold in the, uh, in the Ozarks. You'd have, you know, you see these little one-room schools all over the place, many of which are in, have disappeared and they're only left as a, a name on a map, you know, or something like that. Um, but they would have typically only run for a few months in the fall um, even maybe just a couple of months in the fall, and then, you know, the children would be sent off to get back to work. Uh, so, you know, that, that's, 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 a, that part of, of the growth of government is, is a story for the, for the coming <laughs> books, oh, really. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad I asked that then. And what <laughs> did you, uh, um, I saw someplace that you're a fifth, fifth generation. Yeah. Ozarkian, uh, is that what you, uh, Ozarker is how I, 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 I is the term I use, I guess. Yeah. And where did you go to high school? Uh, South Iron High School in Annapolis, South Missouri. Iron. Yeah. It, um, what, it's, what's the name South, of the town? 
uh, Annapolis. Uh, Anna it's a little town oh. of, of about 300 in the southern part of Iron County, which is why they call it South Iron. It's a, it was a consolidated school. Uh, there was the Annapolis school, and then there was a school in the, the little town called Desarc, which is just south of there. And when yeah. they consolidated, they called it South Iron. Um, you know, and uh, like many rural schools, they were doing the best they could on very limited resources. Um, but I still have a little bit of South Iron pride. <laughs> uh, so do you have occasion to go back oh yeah often or a couple of times a year uh mm -hmm. lately i've been going back more because um uh, i retired in, in at the end of the last semester and so i have more time to take float trips uh, my wife and i do float trips oh. regularly and so we go back down there a lot now mm -hmm. um i i still have a, an aunt who lives in farmington um mm. and a bunch of cousins all around in that in that area so i do get back for family visits and things like that um yeah. so yeah so, I, I go back a lot so uh you said that you were um, a teacher what kind mm -hmm. of what what level what kind of classes did you teach well because i had a journalism degree um i was able to teach um in schools where I could also be the advisor to the student newspaper. And, and so I would either be in the English department because of my English degrees and advising the student newspaper, or I'd be in the department of communication if they had one uh, and then do, do advising like that. So I was always at the college level. Um, and I would sort of bounce back and forth between English and communication and whichever one seemed to be the best fit really kind of. Yeah, yeah. one thing I noticed, and I, uh, I am gonna encourage people to look at your website mm -hmm. and we'll actually put that up on the screen. Um, but I was very uh, interested in the section on, uh, for teachers. Mm -hmm. and, and you have a lot, uh, you, you identify themes and even prompts for English term papers, I think. What, yeah. um, have you, um, uh, do you do many class visits or um, are these books used in classes like that? They are. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and it's kind of interesting that uh, at, uh, at the University of Missouri, um, Ann Mack, who's a teacher who, who I think she's since retired, but she used it in her freshman composition class um, or classes. And I would do class visits to those. And that was a lot of fun because the students would ask me questions based on their reading that I had absolutely no conception of. <laughs> and it's like, well, I never thought about that, but thanks for asking, you know, and then I try to do the best I could. Um, but there's also uh, down at Missouri State University, uh, there's a gentleman who teaches an Ozarks studies uh, course. Um, and he's used the, very, you know, he, I think he used the language of trees in his uh, in his Ozark Studies class once, more as a kind of uh, you know fictional insight into a historical period that it was of importance, um, rather than teaching it as literature or something like that. He taught it more as a kind of a, a a pathway in for the students to to get an understanding of a particular era. So those are, it's a lot of fun. And, and I will, I have to give credit. My dear friend, uh, Alexis Engelbrecht Villafane wrote those, that teacher's guide. Huh? Um, and she did, she was, she's a high, uh, an English teacher herself at the secondary level. So she was able to really put together a great teacher's guide for that, yeah. uh, huh? Huh? for that book. So, uh, so let's talk a bit about your, your new, uh, your latest publication, a collection of short stories, Scattered Lights, which was just published in November, I think. That's right. This, yeah. This past year. What, yeah, um, just brand new. What, and, uh, or what are there, maybe 12 essays? 12? Something like that. Something yeah. like that. 11, 12. Um, and w one thing that uh, captured my attention, and I've not read them all yet, um, but is that you know, there's one from the perspective of a young a young boy, maybe a teenager, uh, Magic Kids, I think is mm -hmm. the title. And then there's another one from the perspective of an elderly woman. 
um, and, and these are written from the first person. Um, is, is that unusual? I mean, um, that you, uh, I, I shouldn't ask unusual, I guess, but I noticed that, I mean, that yeah. caught yeah. my attention. Well, that's one of the things that really appeals to me about writing short stories, short fiction, um, is that you can take on a point of view and really, you know, try to get down into the, a certain mentality or state of mind, but you don't have to stay with it for 80,000 or 100,000 words like you do in a novel, um, which to me is a lot more difficult to sustain, you know, a certain perspective. But I, I you know, to be honest with you, a lot, lots of times I would set a particular uh, perspective like that as a kind of personal challenge and think, okay, Let's see if you can do this, you know, <laughs> let's find out. Can you really get down into the mindset of, you know, an elderly widow who is reminiscing about her past life, you know, and, or in the mindset of a teenage uh, girl um, or, or the mind, you know, there's the mindset of this kind of, you know, ignorant um, seducer who's, a, who's really kind of a mean nasty person and and really to get deep into those mentalities just to you know just to test the limits of your imagination i guess and uh, so i always really enjoy doing that um and and short fiction gives you that opportunity i think in a way that you know i wouldn't necessarily want to inhabit a particular character's mind for too long, <laughs> in some cases, <laughs> just, just from tech for technical reasons as much as anything, but it's really great to do it in short fiction. So, um, is there any danger that people would see themselves in you in these and accuse you, you of telling their life stories? Or <laughs> I hope not. I don't think so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's all pretty imaginary. Um, <laughs> There's there's one story in which uh, it's 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 from the point of view largely of a teenage boy who's a recent high school graduate and uh, at one point his coach tells him that he lacks the killer instinct because that's why he can't be a starter on the ball team uh, and I remember a coach told me that one time that I lacked the killer instinct yeah. <laughs> which it was okay with me I didn't really want to have the killer instinct a compliment yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> but that's about the only directly autobiographical yeah. thing I can think of yeah so there I was thinking uh, um <clears throat> I was going to say there is a newspaper reporter oh. in one story, but he goes slowly mad. Uh, so uh, I don't think <laughs> I don't think I'm drawing on anything personal there, or at least I hope not. <laughs> you hope not, yeah. So um, there's a a book and a movie out um, on Appalachia, the um, Hillbilly Elegy. Mm -hmm. Do you know about that book? Yeah. Oh, well, I've read the book. I haven't seen the movie. Yeah, but oh, uh, the book got mixed reviews, and now the movie is being dumped on, yeah. uh, un, uh, unmercifully, I think. But um, do you feel any uh, obligation to present the Ozarks in a good light or something or anything like that? You know, a I don't social social responsibility. Yeah. I, I really don't, but but I will say, you know, it's it's a really complicated issue, and. I, I, I appreciate you asking me, me that question because it is something I really wrestle with a lot. I think about not just my own writing, but writers about the Ozarks in particular. Um, and the, the, you know, the, one of the, to me, one of the problems with Hillbilly Elegy was there's a kind of a vein uh, or at least a, a sort of a streak of, of self-hatred that's going on in that story um, that I do think Ozarkers display sometimes because they, they sense, you know, there's a kind of projection from outside of them as being inferior, uneducated, ignorant, you know, backward and so forth. And so there is a certain amount of defensiveness that develops and Sometimes that shows itself as a kind of 
you know, self-hatred or self-disregard uh, in, in, in their portrayals. Um, but at the same time, there's also this kind of booster mentality that also shows up. And a lot of the writing about the Ozarks from earlier generations is, uh, I think, you know, overly romanticized about the, the beauties of the place and the natural goodness of the people. And, and you know, you think of the, the Shepherd of the Hills is sort of the classic example of that, where these, you know, you know, hearty, robust hillbillies you know, are, uh, are, you know, have this kind of innate, you know, kind of Rousseau goodness to them, except, except for the bad ones who are really horrible, horrible, bad people. And um, I think, you know, in my own writing, I, I, I try to be critical and unvarnished about my portrayal of, of people. But at the same time, you know, I don't feel any kind of obligation to, to either, you know, look upon them as, as good or bad. And I think there's this kind of a whole generation of, of writers that's going on right now in the Ozarks who are, uh, who have kind of developed this more mature kind of attitude about the place as it's, it's okay to portray it with warts. You know, you don't have to gloss over the, the, the negative uh, side of things. Um, but at the same time, you don't have to just dwell on those warts either. And, and you know, a lot, of, a lot of pop culture portrayals of the Ozarks are of this sort of toothless meth making kind of uh, characters mm -hmm. and all. And uh, while they do exist, that's not the only yeah. you know, aspect yeah. of the region too. Yeah. So um, I take it that you've written um, these over a long period of time or? Yeah. yeah. Over how many years? Um, well, I think the first one, in this? Yeah, I think the first one was published when, when I was still in graduate school, which would oh. have been 1985. Um, yeah. So, you know, I always tried to keep something in the hopper, but of course, during my teaching career, uh, I didn't always have all the time I, I needed. So um, they would they would spread out. Some of them were, were written just this year. There are some stories that are brand new, never been published anywhere. So they go back for whatever that is. That's 35 years, I guess. Yeah. Um, so what's that feeling like? I mean, uh, uh, are you uh, surprised one way the or the other with your contemporary evaluation of your own work? Well, I'm, I'm a little bit pleased in that the old ones hold up. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I was kind of surprised to see that, that the themes or the, the sort of subjects remain fairly consistent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, one of the things I like to, to do in a short story is to put a character into some kind of, uh, I don't want to call it a, like a predicament, but but some element of pressure that's 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 weighing down on the character right from the very beginning and there you know the task of the story is is to see how that character uh, works their way through that predicament um, and that was the case in some of the stuff I just got done with and also in the case with some of the stories that are way back there's kind of a, con a consistent pattern to that. Uh, that kind of surprised me. Um, mm -hmm. I think the the newer stories maybe are a little more, uh, or maybe a little less judgmental of some mm -hmm. of the characters. Uh, some of the early stories tend to be kind of harsh uh, toward <laughs> toward their main toward their protagonists or toward their situations. And maybe I think in recent in later years I've gotten a little more understanding that. Uh, it's okay to just be a mess. <laughs> yeah. huh. so, I guess the two that I compared in my brain the most, mm -hmm. well, one, the magic kids mm -hmm. with uh, weeds and wilderness. Mm -hmm. And I guess I found more compassion with magic kids. And I don't know if that was the topic or if that was your writing. But, uh, but yeah. Well, uh, Magic Kids, it, it's, it's a favorite story of mine, although it's, um, people have told me they find it hard to read just because it's, um, 
it's about a, a, a terrible subject, um, a child who is dying, you know, and, and is everyone around him is is trying to come to terms with the fact that he's he's about to die, uh, which is, you know, that's painful. And, and so some people find that difficult. But I like it because it is that existential, you know, and, and the, the, little, the little boy in the story who is the central character is himself trying to come to terms with that, uh, you know, to the best of his ability. And, and uh, you know, that's sort of what we're ultimately all about anyway, is coming to terms with our own mortality and, and how to make sense out of, out of the life that we're given to live. So. Uh, for that reason, it's kind of a favorite. I also, I like Weeds and Wildness though, and that's that's a recent story um, uh, because, you know, in, in that story, the, the main character is, uh, he's he's young, he's, he's kind of aimless, um, doesn't know what to do with himself. Uh, and, you know, just kind of almost by coincidence, he gets sort of drawn into, uh, the workings of the uh, the harsher adult world, the grown up world around him, um, and you know, being young and kind of unequipped, he doesn't quite know what to do with all that. And uh, um, you know, the, the sense is, I, or I hope anyway, the sense in that story is that that things will will work out in somehow for this guy. <laughs> we don't know how, but, but, but sort of, you know, there's this kind of feeling of things things are not going to be terrible forever for, for the kid. And I, I like that story for that kind of feeling, I guess. So, so um, it seems that most writers I've, I've talked to um, say that they don't really know where a story is going to go when they start. Would you say the same thing? And then... Uh, how do you know when you're finished? Or how do you know when the story's finished? You know, uh, sometimes I don't know, but I'll, usually I do. And in fact, my, <laughs> my, my process is, I, I usually think, uh, you know, I, I'll think of, of something toward the end of the story that I think, okay, that's a really terrific moment or a really kind of revealing uh, scene or something. And I'll kind of back up from that as to, okay, now how do I get a character to that spot? You know, so I'm kind of shooting for something that I, that I have a pretty good sense of uh, where it's going to end up. Although that's not always the case, but usually, but usually that's the case that I work back backwards from something important rather than just sort of putting a character, a couple of characters in motion and then hoping something happens, you know? yeah. <laughs> Although that happens too occasionally, I'll, I'll admit. <laughs> so um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, would you read something from uh, Scattered Lights? Or do I you would have love a, to, yeah. A favorite section or selection? Sure, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll read the opening of Weeds and Wildness, uh, ah. which is, like I said, it's, it's, it, it's a story I'm fond of. Um, but uh, but you know it, it goes on for quite a while, so I'll just uh, I'll just read the opening. Um, yeah, and and just That'd to yeah, just to let folks know that the title comes. There's a poem by Gerard Manley Hopkins um, hmm. that is the the source of that title. It's called Inverse Nade, and uh, uh, you know, it's it's a poem. the The poem itself is about nature, but but I always liked that uh, <clears throat> the final stanza where where the weeds and the wildness show up. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so this is how it begins. Everybody knew Charlie Blankenship to be something of a loose cannon, a man you didn't want to get to an argument with at a ball game or a bar, because you never truly knew what Charlie might do. Swing a log chain, poison your dog, or drunkenly hug you and declare that you were right after all. Mark was in the same class as one of the Blankenship boys, John Wayne. And they shared a spot at the end of the bench during basketball games. 
So he knew Charlie a little from his occasional visits to games where he'd lean over the bench behind them and say, you got this boys, that bunch ain't worth shit except that one dude. Put a couple of you defensive specialists on him and they wouldn't score 30. Defensive specialist was a charitable phrase for someone who had never made the line score except during blowouts. And Mark had always figured that Charlie's appearances were his way of letting his son know he was there supporting him since he wouldn't have much opportunity to cheer if he waited until they were in a game. Coach always called them salt and pepper in a lame attempt at coachly humor since although the two were both average height and average build, Mark was pale and freckled while John Wayne, like his father, had a thick wave of black hair like a 50s rock and roll star and a steady growth of facial hair that seemed entirely inappropriate for a high school student. They knew that their real resemblance was in the fact that they would never get in a game that mattered. Still, a dad hovering behind the bench was an embarrassment. John Wayne remained studiously neutral until his dad returned to the bleachers and then the two of them would exchange a glance of hard boiled high school boy sympathy. So Charlie was a character. Everybody in town knew him, but nobody expected it when the ATF people swooped in and arrested him with a helicopter and a line of cars that sped through town at four in the morning. On the courthouse lawn, they spread out the hall for the cameras belts of ammunition, grenades and grenade launchers, and the centerpiece of the raid, a 50 caliber machine gun that had somehow walked away from Fort Leonard Wood about a year ago. And that's how the story begins. And if people want to know how it turns out, they'll just have to buy the book. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, um, or get it from the library. <laughs> how, um, uh, how many reference, references wouldn't I understand? Like, for example, in the first one, I believe it is, uh, yeah, uh, the boy with religion on his mind, he wanted to distribute tracts. Mm -hmm. What are tracts? I don't know that one. <laughs> those are those little pamphlets uh, that the people oh. will give you at the door that say, uh, you know, have you been short. saved? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Like the Jehovah's Witnesses do, yeah. or the Mormons, or things like that. A little religious uh, yeah. things. Well, do most people know that word? Or am I? I mean, I, uh, I hope so. <laughs> I oh, yeah. Well, no, <laughs> yeah. I could figure it out, of course, right. but I didn't know. So I was just curious. Um, in the other stories, mm -hmm. are there many um, references that could be regional? Or it, uh, uh, you know, I think it would help people if they knew something about the area. But just in general, I don't think there'd be much that would which, be uh, too too specific. Um, yeah. You know, that there are a lot of geographic references, but there those geographic references are not necessary this, yeah. to the understanding of the story. You know, um, I said a lot of them in a in a town called Piedmont. And there really is a town called yeah, there Piedmont, is. Yeah. Okay. but it's but it's not the setting of the stories. I just like the name. Um, I lived in Piedmont for a while, and I was always I just liked the name Piedmont because it means you know foot of the mountain, and so there's a kind of uh, know, symbolic or at least kind of a resonance to the name that I always liked. So I thought, well, I'll just borrow that name and and apply it to my fictional community. <laughs> I, I hope the folks in Piedmont don't think I'm writing specifically about them. Yeah, so um, I've been down through some of those counties, mm -hmm. but um, oh, I tend to teach, I, I taught junior and senior classes mostly, but so I would know the students in my class. And I, I know some from oh, Cape Girardeau, Walla, but mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever mm -hmm. had a student from Steelville, for mm -hmm. example, or Piedmont. Um, so in your experience at the University of Missouri, 
do you think that people, uh, and I've had students from West Plains for mm -hmm. some reason, maybe it's just that I remember these people, Right. but um, right. in your experience, are people from the Ozarks uh, represented at the University of Missouri? Not particularly, no. <laughs> um, you know, uh, well, I think the university has, you know, tried to expand its reach, you know, and now it's pulling a lot of students from Chicago and oh, yeah. places yeah. like that. Yeah. And, you know, you hate to um, speculate, but I, th there are a lot of, like when I was a kid from South Iron High School, um, I went to the University of Missouri on a scholarship, which was able pretty much to pay my way. Um, and it wasn't that big of a scholarship, but it, but it paid my way. And, and my parents, who were very much working class folks, uh, were able to, to send me to the university for, as a result. I doubt if that applies to most of the kids from the Ozarks now, unless you're the, the child of the banker or the child of the, That's you know, think. somebody like that. I, I kind of suspect they've been priced out uh, for the most part, yeah. which is, un you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but it is what it is, uh, you know. And, uh, well, and perhaps uh, the development of Missouri State University and then what, what, what University of Missouri Southeast, I guess we call it. Yeah, Southeast Missouri State, Missouri Southeast State, East. and so, um, you know. But they seem to have grown more. Yeah, yeah, and mm -hmm. and they have become sort of this, this the regional school of choice yeah. uh, rather than than Mizzou, which yeah. is uh, you know perceived anyway, I think, as a more uh, elite focused institution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you um, about your um, involvement in the Missouri Writers Guild. Mm -hmm. um, what does that do? Well, the Missouri Writers Guild is an old, old, old organization. It was founded in 1917, I think, um, oh. at, at the University of Missouri by oh, really? Walter. Oh. Yeah, by Walter Williams. Um, oh yeah. And a and a group of fellow writers at the time. And it, it has had its ups and downs through the decades, uh, through the century, I guess. Um, when I was involved in it, um, we had an annual conference every year. We sponsored prizes for writers and, um, you know, tried to be a kind of statewide organization. Now, Columbia, of course, has a, has a Columbia Writers Guild which is a chapter of the Missouri Writers Guild. And there are lots of these chapters all over the state designed to kind of foster and encourage uh, writers and you know, serve as a kind of meeting place. And I, I'm a member of the Columbia Writers Guild and it's a wonderful organization, very you know, welcoming. And um, you know, if, if you're thinking about you know, becoming a writer or writing yeah. a memoir or something like that, it's a great place to go because everybody greets you, they welcome you, and they oh, yeah. they sure. they applaud your everything. It's really a very supportive group. Uh, the the statewide group they don't have those kind of monthly meetings, but we would have an annual state state meeting mm. uh, and mm. sponsor statewide prizes and things like that. I've since uh, for the last couple of years so, while I've been working on my own stuff, I've kind of lost my connection with the state organization, although. Mm. Uh, uh, they're, it's, it's still in existence. They've got a new president or, and, and they're, uh, they're stu still doing the same kind of work. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I'm not quite as in touch with them as I have been in the past. Yeah. yeah. And I imagine that like every other organization, COVID has probably shut them down the last couple yeah, the last nine and, months or whatever. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The Columbia Writers Guild has been meeting via Zoom, and uh, oh yeah. Uh, of course, they publish an annual anthology, uh, which you you know people buy, um, mm. but it's all being done remotely and that sort of thing yeah. too. Yeah. So, um, it, oh, is it mostly creative writers as exposed uh, compared to journalists and 
nonfiction. Yeah, pretty much. Although there are a lot of people in there who are writing some version, like I'm just thinking of the Columbia Guild right now, uh, uh, who are writing a, some version of a memoir or, mm -hmm. a, you know, nonfiction article writing kind of thing. We do have several writers in the Columbia Guild who, uh, who are very regular contributors to magazines like Missouri Life and, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, publications like that, Missouri, rural Missouri, and those those kinds of things. So there's there is a non a, a pretty strong nonfiction stream that goes on. Uh, I guess maybe two thirds though are either fiction or poetry people. And, uh, well, I, 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 God bless the poets. You know, I'm I'm not a poet myself. Uh, I I tried a few poems when I was younger, and I just sort of figured well. I'm not very good at that, so <laughs> I'll move on. Uh, but but the Columbia Writers Guild does have a good share of poets uh, well, at, at work too. And then um, I've noticed I have checked out some of the entries on your blog, mm -hmm. and they are they are, are, are literary as well. So um, is there much of a internet uh, replacement of published books? I mean, or is there any chance that your next short story would be totally online? I doubt that. Although one of sort of uh, one of the, my um, sort of hidden agendas with my blog is that I I do kind of return to the same uh, subjects again and again over mm -hmm. the years, and I and at some point I think it would be nice to collect all of those into something that's that's book length or you know pretty sizable. But those would be nonfiction kinds of uh, yeah. reflections mm -hmm. rather than yeah. fictional ones. I still, I'm still a fan of uh, print, ink and so paper I. printing, you Me know, too. And <laughs> so yeah. I, I don't ever want to give that up and just go yeah. completely online. It didn't, it just didn't work quite as yeah. well for me. <laughs> Plus I do, um, uh, you know, most of my reading in my life has been academic uh -huh. social science and people, I mean, I am I've met people who are startled that I could read statistics and all that stuff. But for me, it's much easier than all of these characters. So I find myself going back a couple pages to see who said what. Yeah. And online yeah. and and the electronic ver version, I've not been able to no. get into that. Or yeah. Yeah. You know, really dedicated Kindle readers. You know, they have the ability to like put notes in and things like that. Yeah. And I think, well, that's what you can do with a pencil. So, uh, you know, <laughs> that's right. why go to that's all right. that other trouble? So yeah. uh, huh. I'm still I'm still a kind of old school where that where yeah. that is concerned. Huh. Huh. We're very good. Uh, our time is about up. Um, I will make sure that we uh, include uh, your blog and your website so people can follow up. Um, I've enjoyed finding a out about you, I just happened to read a, re a book review in the Post-Dispatch, which right. is how I right. first uh, 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 became aware of your work, but I've enjoyed it quite a bit, so. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. And and since this is for the Historical Society, I, I do hope that uh, folks would get a chance to take a look at the historical uh, fiction. Uh, as far as I'm aware, all of my books are available at the, at the public library. So it doesn't even necessarily involve a financial commitment yeah. on their part. Well, I guess. <laughs> very good. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Thank you, David. It's been great.